little girl was once sitting on her grandfather's lap as he read her a bedtime story. From time to time, she would take her eyes off the book and reach up to touch his wrinkled face. She would alternately stroke her own cheek, and then she'd reach up and touch his cheek, and then her cheek, then his. And then she asked Sadie, did God make you? Yes, Tatala, he answered. God made me a very long time ago. Oh. And Zadie, did God make me too? Yes, indeed, he said. God made you just a little while ago. And feeling their respective faces one more time. She observed, God's getting better at it, isn't he? <laughs> Children are wonderfully honest, straight to the point and perceptive. And sometimes the thoughts they share can touch and teach us in ways that a grown person, having forgotten the wisdom of youth, will take a lifetime to relearn. Sometimes their words and questions can simply warm and melt the hardest of grown-up hearts. For theirs is a world of security and innocence, of safety and of love. But sometimes their words reflect a different world, a troubled world. Sometimes the words that children share today stop us to the quick with chilling insight into themselves and their relationships with us, with others, their pains and their needs. It really wasn't so long ago, I think not last year, but the year before and the year before that, that during our Tuesday night high school program, we asked our students, grade seven through 12, to answer questions that we instructed them to answer anonymously so that we could later do an exercise with them and their parents, which we had done. No one could have expected the magnitude of their response in kind or in number. The second of the two questions asked our students to describe an order that they would give to their parents if they knew their parents had to obey it. These are the most common of the answers. They would have to listen to me for once in my life. Don't yell at me because I don't get good grades. I'm doing the best I can. Love each other. Mom and dad, stop fighting and yelling at each other. Never fall in love or get married again. Please love me no matter what I do. <clears throat> Always love me, support me, be there for me. Spend more time with me. Don't keep expecting so much from me. Love me, hug me, don't leave me. Don't yell at me so much. Leave me alone. <laughs> and then crossed out. Help me. The answers to the first questions, what would you ask your parents if you knew they had to answer you truthfully, are even harder to listen to. Do you guys love each other? Are you guys getting a divorce? Dad, why do you take your stress out on me by saying mean things? Why are you so strict? Why do you put so much pressure on me to do well in school? Which kid is your favorite? Do you love me? Would you still love me even if I did something really bad? Would you love me no matter what? Why do you love me? Why did you conceive me? Are you really my friend? Do you promise we will always love each other? 
Can you spend every minute you can with me? Profound statements and questions of this season. Now, many of our teens seem content, and yet the pressures of adolescence and life in the 21st century are fairly universal enough to warrant our consideration. I mean, how well do we know our children? And how do we know that we know our children? Outward behaviors are not always indicative of inner emotions. Some act out, some turn inward, and many wear a mask to hide the insecurity within. Now, I really do hear and see wonderful interactions within our families here. I hear from teens who are absolutely well-adjusted, adore their parents, and are exactly where they should be on the path to self-realization. But I also hear from teens the comments I listed above, many whose questions are their way of saying, I need you to help me to feel connected, to feel loved, listened to, valued, safe. It used to be some time ago that I was away from home much more than I am now. And when Adrian and I would talk on the phone, she would fill me in on the goings and comings of our family. And I must admit, there were times when I would feel so clueless about what she was telling me that I had to wonder what planet I had been living on. There was one particular time when Adrian had told me of an incident with one of our sons that had happened something like only a couple of days before. Now, as it turns out, I was arriving home later that evening. And so after greeting Adrian, I went to see our son. And he was playing a video game, deeply engrossed, as aliens or zombies or something like that was coming at him from every direction on the screen. So I hear someone was banging on the store window where he worked with a gun, and you had to drop to the floor and call the police. Yeah. A short answer. The aliens were relentless. Did they arrest the guy? Don't know. More dead aliens. Well, why didn't you tell me about it? At which point he did pause the game, although only long enough to respond. It wasn't that big of a deal. Besides, it's over now. Game back on. Not that big of a deal, I began to reprimand. Someone banging and waving a gun at you? Uh, you know, you have my cell phone number. And even as those words were leaving my lips, I knew how incredibly stupid and self-centered I was being. Of course it was a big deal. And it happened two days ago, an eternity of time. And why has it taken you two days to know what happened? And for God's sake, why aren't you asking after him rather than reprimanding him for you feeling hurt that he didn't reach out? I regrouped. And I told him that I loved him and wanted him to know that I was worried about him and that I was really, really very proud of him for getting through the ordeal, or at least I think I did. I hope I did. Still all of this to the back of his head as aliens kept coming and he kept blowing them away. Often as parents and teachers and adults in general, we hear, fine, I'm okay, nothing, I've got it handled. And in truth, short answers are the hallmark of adolescence. But the reality is short answers are a learned response, a protective response used by children and carried into our adulthood as well. 
being a parent and being a child are no easy things. The way we relate and respond to each other is further complicated by trying to live up to the example of our society's mythologies, like the Andersons, father knows best, and the Huxtables, <laughs> Cosby show. It's further complicated by the missteps of trial and error. And for parents in particular, it's complicated by the ongoing process of sorting through our own childhood development. In other words, the job of maturation, of trying to figure out who we are as individuals, independent of perceived societal expectations, independent of our parents, independent of our own raising, and independent of whatever our parents passed on to us from whatever our grandparents passed on to them, it never ends. Sometimes healthy parenting makes its way forward. But more often than not, it's not so healthy. After creating heaven and earth, God created Adam and Eve. And the first thing God said was, don't. <laughs> don't what? Asked Adam. Don't eat the forbidden fruit. Forbidden fruit? We have forbidden fruit? Cool. Hey, Eve, we have forbidden fruit. No way. Yeah, way. Do not eat the fruit. Why? They asked in unison. Because I'm your parent, and I said so. God replied, wondering why he hadn't stopped after making the elephants. <laughs> a few minutes later, God saw Adam and Eve eating an apple, and God was mad. Didn't I tell you not to eat the fruit? Uh-huh, Adam replied. Then why are you eating it? I don't know, said Eve. She started it, said Adam. <laughs> did not, did too, did not. And having had it with the two of them, God's punishment was that Adam and Eve should have children of their own. <laughs> Thus setting the patterns of children and parents to be relived in every generation. How many of us, after a fight with our parents or being fined with some punishment, said to ourselves, not when I have kids. <laughs> I will never do that to my kids. And how many of us, in the heat of the moment, have found ourselves possessed by what can only be described as some ancient mom-dad specter of the underworld as we channeled those very same words we swore up and down 20 times on our way to our room we would never, ever say. <laughs> Have you ever pointed out there are children starving in China? <laughs> Have you ever begun a sentence by saying you think you've got it rough? <laughs> Have you ever told them how you had to hike to school uphill both ways in the freezing cold and how you never complained? Have you ever shared that eternal piece of parental paradox? If you don't stop crying, I'll find something for you to really cry about? And have you ever responded? Because I said so. Where does that come from? <laughs> well, I guess now we know. God said so. The more in question, important question is, why do we continue it? Or the myriad other things much more painful if we ourselves remember the pain of being on the receiving end. In part, it's because having been hurt, even as children, we bury the pain, to survive the moment. Yet no matter how deep we bury it, even to the deepest recesses of our psyche, nothing ever stays buried. In moments of anger or rage or consternation, even decades later on in life, 
a nerve is hit that opens the passage to where the pain was stored. And like an autonomic response, there it is, out in the open. Words can take mere seconds to open profound wounds. And yet it can take years and years for those wounds to go away. As a general rule, children are loyal to their parents. Rather than blame us for our impatience, our lack of time, our gruffness, our irrationality, they internalize our reaction as something that they deserve. And yet the human response to protect one's emotional integrity is strong. So why confide in someone if we know it will only hurt our feelings? Why open our heart if we know it will be followed by a criticism or a dismissive reply? Why cheerfully share that we achieved a B if we know we are going to hear, great, next time let's get an A, rather than fantastic, that's so cool, I'm so proud of you. Why run up to say hi only to be brushed aside with not now, I'm really tired. See, these things, they hurt. They bring us to understand that we're not worthy of praise or consideration or time. And why subject oneself to that pain? Short answers avoid openings to be trivialized, to face indifference, to be criticized, or to be yelled at. But the need for approval still remains. I've officiated at too many a funeral where the child, already a grandparent, mourns the inner uncertainty of whether they had their parents' unconditional love. And the sad reality is that many times their own children wonder the same thing about them. What we internalize as kids remains with us as we grow. Our learned responses become the mode by which we operate in the world with our friends, with our partners, with our progeny. Short answers block us from risking the resurrection of insecurities we've tried for a lifetime to put away often by resorting to proving our worth in all types of harmful ways. I think for all of us, we are each afraid of a lot of things. Our children are afraid of failure, afraid of not being strong enough, smart enough, successful enough, popular enough, of not getting into the right college, of not being loved, simply for who they are, no matter what they can or cannot do. Adults are afraid of being wrong, of being alone, of being infantilized, of not being in charge, of not being perfect, of not providing. But I truly think that what unsettles each of us the most is not knowing absolutely that we are unconditionally valued by the very people who are supposed to value us unconditionally. These days of our awe are about hearing and asking tough questions. They are about facing what needs to be faced. They are about healing and they are about forgiveness. But even with hearing and asking and facing what needs to be faced, Healing cannot come before forgiveness. And to forgive anyone else, we have to first be able to forgive ourselves, as strange as that might seem. Before we can go on to be a healing, affirming presence in anyone's life, we need to be a healing, affirming presence and force in our own. 
we have to forgive the child whom we blamed for whatever may have been passed down to us. No child ever merits to be made to feel anything other than worthy and loved. And we need to forgive the adult we are today for all that we carry with us. For we have been doing the best we can to manage our lives. But then we must also begin to forgive the ones and the forces that have sent us behind our mask. What is done is in the past. Bring it into the light, know it for what it is, and understand that it has no power of its own to hurt. Then leave it on the side of the road. Those before us had no more skill than we have. Allow the light of forgiveness to fill the recesses of the soul where the hurt once lay. Turn to the ones we've carried our pain forward to and begin your lives together again. Assured in the knowledge that you are worthy, you are loved, you are needed. Stop the cycle of self-doubt. Stop the cycle of hurt. Stop the hiding. This year, today, no. You truly are as God created you, glorious. And lastly, know that it is never, never, never too late. No matter how irascible you may think you are. For all the things that these holy days are for, Perhaps they are most of all for hope. And so hear these, these words. Hear these words that are also of our children. Teach me. Return the love I give you. Hope for the best. Love me and trust me, respect me, listen even to my silence. Call on me when you need help. Believe in yourselves. Remember, you are good parents. I love you. Good jump.